to our guest speaker series. It's been a long time. <laughs> this is the first time we've been able to have a group like this in about 18 months. So welcome back. Um, and it's nice to see such a full house because I wasn't sure how many people we were going to have tonight. And I think he used up all my chairs. So <laughs> now I know my maximum capacity here. Um, but uh, tonight uh, we have Bill Kaufman here to talk about his, his latest work, the Congressional Journal of Harbor Carnival, which we do have copies still in the gift shop if anybody's interested. And if we run out, I have ordered more already. So just stop back by another time and we'll have a copy for you. Um, Bill has written several books and we have several of those even also in the bookstore. So I'm really trying to pump up your sales, Bill. So. Um, a little more enthusiasm. I'm yeah. trying. <laughs> You're much too dead to you. <laughs> He's being honest. <laughs> say about Bill, but, um, <laughs> but he's, he's been uh, done a lot for the museum here, so we're, we're happy to have him back to speak again. Uh, I do want to uh, announce the presence of a couple honored guests here. Uh, Emily Conable and James Meter are here, or Barbara's daughters, so it's nice of them to <laughs> If you are so inclined, afterwards we do have a little bit of a display set up back there with some uh, memorabilia and pictures and things from Barber and uh, the family, so feel free to en enjoy those. And we do have some water, coffee, and cookies on the table. There's still some left. Jim Owen hasn't eaten all of them yet, so we're on today. Um, and uh, just so everybody knows, this is actually going to be up on our YouTube channel after tonight. Um, Mr. Paul Fidlow is doing that for us, so, and I didn't know this, but Howard Owens here from the Batavian, so I'll also be on there, so we're all going to be famous, but uh, <laughs> I've talked long enough, so Bill, you are more than welcome to come on up. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's a great turnout. Let's violate the fire code, huh? <laughs> Hi, also, Gretel, Lucine, Mark, Jane, right there. It's great to be back. Uh, I served for years on the board of the Holland Purchase Historical Society, along with Barbara and Charlotte Conable. The Conables used to call it the Hysterical Society. Um, I'm sure it's calmed down since then. It's close to 60 years since Barbara Conable was first elected to public office. Time to fly. Conable was as highly, and high, as highly and widely respected as any member of Congress in the last half of the 20th century, according to Richard Fenno, the Dean of Congressional Scholars. But fame is fleeting in our TikTok age. If you're not yet eligible for membership in the AARP, you probably don't remember the greatest political figure by far our region has ever produced. Barbara Benjamin Conable Jr. was born November 2nd, 1922 in Warsaw. He had a patriotic pedigree. An ancestor, Thomas Crafts, had been both participant and supplier of the Mohawk Indian dress for the Boston Tea Party. Barbara's father, Barbara Sr., served 28 years as Wyoming County Judge and was succeeded by his son, John, who served 32 years in that position, which is why miscreants in the county to our south have justice inflicted upon them today in the Carnival courtroom. Young Barbara hated his first name, you know how little kids are, cruel to their very marrow. He was teased by classmates with an old nursery rhyme. Barber, barber, shave a pig. How many hairs will make a wig? Four and 20, that's enough. Give the barber a pinch of snuff. That one was obsolete by the time I was a tyke. But, uh, maybe it made him tough, a la Johnny Cash's boy named Sue. And his distinctiveness would come in handy for the candidate. During Barber's first congressional race, a barbershop quartet of young women sang for him. And even late into his career, some of his less attentive constituents were sure that they were represented by a nice lady named Barbara. Barber and his two brothers were drilled by their parents in the fundamentals of civic and personal responsibility. 
though the lessons were uh, leavened with a dollop of agrarian eccentricity. His father had them recite Shakespeare and poetry as they milked the cows. Curiously, another of our native sons, the novelist John Gardner, had the same eccentric poetry reciting cow milking experience. So I'm thinking we must have very literate cows around here. <laughs> Barbara's mother and grandmother, Margaret Gownlock, uh, were suffragists. His grandmother was a close friend of Susan B. Anthony's. So I came by my feminism honestly, he said. I wasn't just being a milk toast for my wife's enthusiasm. Barbara attended Cornell, where he majored in medieval history and helped to organize the anti-war America First Committee. Like his father, he was a pacifist who opposed US involvement in foreign wars. But after graduating Cornell at age 19, he enlisted in the Marines over the bitter objections of his father and eventually went ashore as a second lieutenant at Iwo Jima on February 19, 1945. He remembered thinking as he landed on the beach at the base of Mount Suribachi, my God, I'm going to be killed on my father's birthday. He received an area scratch. Then came law school. He graduated first in his class at Cornell, an unhappy stint with a prestigious Buffalo law firm in the Korean War, after which Barbara and his new bride, Charlotte Williams, a Buffalo native and Cornell graduate, moved to Batavia. This is how he later described his introduction to our fair city. The day I came to Batavia and opened my law office, I rented a little office up over 12 Main Street in the Schaefer Building for $55 a month. It was in bad shape, and I had to go down and get some stuff to fix it up. I went to the nearest hardware store, Genesee Hardware, three or four do doors down from where I was. Carl Buckholtz was standing behind the counter. He looked up at me and turned white. He said, my God, you must be related to George Gownlock. I said, yes, as a matter of fact, he was the first cousin of mine. He says, who are you? I said, my name is Conable and I'm from Warsaw. He said, what are you doing here? <laughs> very, very, Batavia's a very welcoming city. <laughs> I said, well, I'm opening a law office down the street. He said, you'll be my lawyer. George was my best friend. Uh, George Gownlock was killed uh, on D-Day at Normandy Beach. Conable continues. Carl was the president of the Rotary Club, and three months later, he rammed me into the Rotary Club over the dead body of every other lawyer in town. The following year, I directed the, the Rotary Club show, and the following year, I was the president of the Rotary Club. And that became a very important part of my clientele. I ran three major fund drives the first six months I was in Batavia because I didn't have anything else to do. Charlotte was working at the YWCA to eke out a living for us because I wasn't making any money. The law held few charms for him. He recalled, I was not a tremendously successful lawyer because I cut my fees to everybody on the grounds that I didn't think my services were worth much. And I became everybody's slave, particularly people who were looking for cheap lawyers. All I could think of is that Jim Owen probably would have used him in the 1950s. The word is conservative. <laughs> Barbara got involved in politics as chairman of the city of Batavia's Republican Committee. After he and Charlotte bought a circa 1830 hybrid federal Greek revival home in Alexander, today the home of Matt and Molly Grimes, he took on the job of Genesee County Republican campaign chairman. And in 1962, he made a fateful decision. He challenged the powerful and corrupt state senator from this district, one Austin Irwin. Conable told the Genesee County Republican Party chairman, I won't be campaign chairman if that old bastard Austin Irwin is on the ticket because he's a crook. In fact, said Conable, he just might run against Irwin in a primary. The chairman warned Conable that he'd be throwing away his career if he challenged Irwin. It was one of those you'll never work again in this town punk moments. Undaunted, Conable threw his hat in the ring. Irwin backed down. Conable whipped an Irwin protege, and a career was launched. By the way, there's an Austin Irwin Hall at SUNY Geneseo. I suppose that's where they hold classes in bribery and kickbacks. <laughs> Two years later, after making a name for himself in the New York State Senate with his heroic defense of rural schools against the technocratic onslaught of consolidation, Conable was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives. He would serve 10 terms, or 20 years in Congress, and on multiple occasions, he was voted the most respected member of the House by staffers, journalists, and his fellow members. 
He was distinctive in several ways. For one, Conable, virtually alone among members of Congress, wrote his own newsletter to constituents. Pretty much every other member filled, and today fills, his or her newsletter with braggadocio, self-glorification, photos of the member handing out government money to beaming supplicants. These new newsletters are a tax subsidized, taxpayer subsidized joke. Conable didn't do that. He wrote thoughtful meditations on the issues of the day or the responsibilities of a congressman. He viewed these as partly educational, partly conversational. Senator Pat Moynihan, who greatly admired Conable, announced with fanfare that he too was going to write his own newsletters. But after a couple of such essays, things got in the way. Conable drove his colleagues nuts with his fundraising practices. Early in his career as a member of the Tax Writing Ways and Means Committee, he had seen votes traded for contributions, so he set a strict limit of $50 on gifts to his own campaigns. He joked that it merely signified that it could be bought more cheaply than any other member of the House. <laughs> Gerald Ford and other party leaders badgered him on this, saying, you know, come on, man, you're making us look bad. I don't think Ford said, come on, man. But, <laughs> but Conable refused to budge. Even in the Watergate election of 1974, when the Democrats ran the charismatic vice mayor of Rochester, Mitch Costanza, against him. Midge outspent him two to one, and the poll said he was on the ropes, but Conable won. Conable had an almost mystical connection to his district, at least the portion of it that included Genesee and Wyoming counties. Richard Fenno, the legendary political scientist whom I mentioned at the outset, traveled with Conable as he was writing his classic book, Homestyle. Fenno wrote, From the time we spent driving through the district during that first visit, I picked up something more basic and more permanent, his attachment to a place and the values and practices of that place. His comment to me with his, about his identification with the rural people of his district was almost poetic in nature because it came just as we left the four-lane superhighway from Rochester and turned onto the two-lane road to Byron. Suddenly, he said, it must be terrible to be without roots, without a place to call home. I have a profound sense of identification with these rural people. I worry about the rootlessness of our people, about the changes that are taking place in our values, which were, after all, pretty durable. Soon he brightened and said, it won't be long now. Here are the Byron suburbs. Those are Gerald Britt's beets growing over there. He grows 3% of all the edible beets in the United States. Here's Conable again, or here's Fenno again, rather. During my first visit, Conable displayed another personal behavior pattern that distinguished him from every elective politician I would ever know. It was a distinctiveness related partly to shared rural small town values, expectations, and partly to his self-confidence in connecting with his constituents. Not once in all our time together did a staff person accompany us, not in the car and not at any event. As the years went by, the plaudits for Barbara Conable piled up. Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, the journalists who uncovered Watergate, said that, quote, he was regarded by his colleagues as almost puritanical in his standards of personal and political conduct a man of unquestioned integrity, end quote. George Will concluded, quote, there has never been a better congressman, end quote. Conable declined to seek re-election in 1984. 20 years, he said, was enough. He was showered with offers to sell out as a lobbyist, but rejected them all. As he once said to me, now why would I stick around Washington? That's what many of my colleagues do. They stay there and practice law or lobby, and that's one of the most foolish things in the world. There's nothing deader than a dead politician. I recall my dear friends Wilbur Mills and Al Ullman coming to lobby me after they had gone to their rewards one way or another, and I would duck into doorways to avoid them because they would be asking me for things that I knew they didn't believe in. They were pure mercenaries. By the way, almost everyone who has represented this congressional district in the 30 years since Conable retired stayed in D.C. and exploited their position for personal financial gain. They pay lip service to Barbara Conable, but they don't follow his example. To his surprise, Conable was offered the job of president of the World Bank by President Reagan. He accepted, served a five-year term, and then came home to Alexander. Over the next dozen years, he moved seamlessly between worlds. One day, he would fly to Washington to chair the Smithsonian's Board of Regents, and the next night, he and Charlotte would be sitting around the table here with those of us on the board of the Hysterical Society. Mr. Conable manned the cash box at the Society's annual yard sale. 
As then museum director Pat Weissen joked to him, Carnival was qualified for this job by virtue of having been a teller at the World Bank. <laughs> Good <one>, Pat. <laughs> Parenthetically, one of the most breathtaking acts of parliamentary maneuvering I ever saw was performed at an historical society annual meeting back in the 1990s when Mr. Carnival and J.D. LeSueur disposed of a really vexatious problem in the society, and Mrs. Carnival put a classy and graceful period at the end of it. In retirement, Barbara Carnival gave a dozen or so talks a year on local history and culture. Every July 4th, he read the Declaration of Independence in his booming stentorian voice at the Genesee Country Village and Museum. Saturday mornings, he kept his date for coffee with the boys at Carl Buckholz's Genesee Hardware, even though not by now the boys were in their 80s. Reminds me when I was a kid, we'd see these, uh, these stooped ancient old ladies walking down the street, and my dad would say, oh, there go the Mar girls. <laughs> <laughs> the last time I saw Barbara Carnival, he spoke plaintively about the ephemeral nature of his legislative accomplishments, likening them to footprints on a sandy beach washed away by the tide. His most lasting achievement, he said with bemusement, seemed to be his authorship of the provision in the 1978 tax bill that effectively legalized home brewing and made him the legislative father of the microbrewery revolution. He said he'd merely done it as a favor for a constituent and had no idea that he was releasing a veritable ocean of IPAs and porters on a thirsty nation. <laughs> In 2018, Jane Connable Schmieder, one of Barbara and Charlotte's four children, asked if I'd like to read the journal her father kept for 17 of his 20 years in Congress. I knew about it. He'd occasionally read an excerpt to visitors. But Mr. Connable had left instructions that it was to be kept largely off limits for a period of time sufficient that most of those mentioned therein would have passed away. He didn't want to embarrass anyone, not even the scoundrels. I read the journal and was tremendously impressed. Most of it was spoken into a dictaphone while he commuted to and from work or on the drive from Washington to Alexander and back. Yet it reads as if composed while he was sitting at a desk. How a person can drive through Rock Creek Parkway traffic while speaking in complete sentences and felicitous prose is beyond me. I'd hate to have been driving the car next to him. <laughs> anyway, I suggested that we get the journal published and the University Press of Kansas, probably the best political science press in the country, brought it out this month. To get it down to a publishable length, I had to cut it from about 400,000 to about 150,000 words. This is a rare genre. There have been very few congressional diaries published, and most are basically political advertisements depicting their authors as valorous knights of the round table doing battle against the evil forces of the opposing party. Carnival's journal, written in real time and kept under lock and key for decades, is a warts and all description of how a bill becomes a law what a congressman does, and what many of the notable and notorious personages of his era were like. I'm told that Mr. Carnival always wanted to write a novel about the early European settlement of our area. He never did, but as the journal reveals, he had a talent for describing people. There are sharply incised portraits of presidents, would-be presidents, and both the fearless and the spearless leaders of his day. Richard Nixon, Wilbur Mills, Jack Kemp, Bob Dole, George Bush, and a cast of hundreds. Among them, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. I've been lucky. Richard Fenno, the great congressional scholar, was my mentor at the U of R. Barbara Carnival was my friend. And Pat Moynihan was my boss for two and a half years. I didn't feel so lucky at the time. <laughs> but in retrospect, my Moynihan experience provided a great education. Carnival and Moynihan had a really interesting mutual admiration society that was punctuated by fierce quarrels. Carnival always split his ticket in the voting booth to cast a vote for the Democrat Moynihan. And Moynihan once enraged local Democrats by showing up at a Republican rally in Batavia during election season and telling the astonished audience that Congress without Barbara Carnival is unthinkable. But Moynihan also disappointed Carnival, who praised him one minute and called him a blatherer and a jowl-shaking party hack the next. Yet Moynihan, for all his manifold flaws, had a profound understanding and appreciation of, of New York State, all its regions, and of Barbara Carnival. Mr. Carnival once told me this story. Senator Jack Danforth had a little social security amendment that was stupid and wasn't going to go anywhere. We had a conference on the bill that included this amendment of his. Nobody on the House side wanted it, 
and not many on the Senate side. But Moynihan gets up and makes a speech about this wonderful amendment. Jack was looking over at us and hoping someone would say something on the House side. I finally got up and said I hadn't really supported this at the outset, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought it was something we could live with. Pat was sitting at the other end of the semicircle of conferees. He took his pencil out of his mouth, threw it down on the table, and it bounced way up. He stalked around the back of the circle, came over and sat in the empty seat next to me, and said, <clears throat> I would do my morning hand impression here, but I haven't had anything to drink yet. <laughs> Now, Connable, are you or are you not an unreconstructed conservative Republican upstate bastard? I said, now, don't give me a tough time on this, Pat. You supported it. He said, yes, but I am not an unreconstructed conservative Republican upstate bastard. I said, well, Pat, you know it's not going anywhere, and I wanted to give a little vote of confidence to Jack Danforth, the sweet man. Don't worry, none of my boys are going to vote for it. And he said, well, Connable, I want to tell you, if you aren't an unreconstructed conservative Republican upstate bastard, what good are you? Gosh, that's the second time I've used the B word in this talk. Uh, I'm only quoting other people. I eschew profanity. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Except in books. <clears throat> Barbara Carnival always had the great virtue of frankness and candor, though at times he worried it would be his undoing. He had been a congressman for only six years when he was elevated into the House leadership. And at meetings with President Nixon, he was forthright, speaking his mind. After those meetings, he wondered why his colleagues clammed up and left the blunt talk to him. He was actually a key Nixon ally in Nixon's first term because he agreed with several of Nixon's domestic initiatives. For the longest time, he refused to say whether he'd vote to impeach the president or not. He held to this quaint Boy Scout notion that maybe he should actually read all the evidence before making up his mind. But once he realized that Nixon had lied to the country and to him, he was furious. Nixon sent him letters of explanation and apology after his resignation. Conable refused to answer them. He was a close friend and ally of Gerald Ford's when Ford was House Republican Minority Leader. In fact, Betty Ford blamed Conable for her husband's ascension to the Vice Presidency and later Presidency. He had no illusions that Ford was particularly bright or skillful. At one point, he records feeding Ford a witty line to use before the cameras, and of course, Ford messes it up. <laughs> but he had great respect for Ford's basic decency and honesty and openness. Conable consistently underestimated Ronald Reagan's political appeal, in part because he was chairman of the National Steering Committee of his former Ways and Means colleague and good friend George H.W. Bush's 1980 presidential campaign. Conable was a great booster of the first Bush, though we came to view him as excessively timid and too much a party man. Barbara Conable died on November 30th, 2003. Charlotte passed in 2013. Their stone is in the Alexander Village Cemetery on whose board of trustees Barbara served. The Conable plot is in the western verge of the cemetery, adjacent to a pasture. He wanted the Schmieder cows to come to his funeral, said his daughter Emily. The couple is commemorated with a black marble bench on which is etched the message, reach out. Every May, the village of Alexander is brilliant with flowering crab apple trees that line its streets. These were a gift from Barbara Conable. As his daughter Jane explained, he loved Alexander. He was so enormously attached to that place as his home that he wanted to give it a beautiful gift and pay it back, at the same time making it more beautiful with its own special identity. If we in Genesee County are to retain our own special identity, we need to pay it back too. One way to do so is to remember, to honor, and each in our own way to emulate Barbara Conable. Thanks for listening. If anyone has any questions, I'll do my best to dodge them. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> some of it was easy. I mean, there was some, there was some repetition. Uh, and there were accounts of like visits to embassies and that sort of thing that I thought we could uh, uh, excise easily. Um, there was some talk about, there wasn't really much talk about local politics um, uh, other than like redistricting every 10 years. And he had a lot of complaints about the Monroe County Republican Party. Uh, sorry, Pat. 
<laughs> but actually, you know, he didn't. He never ragged on anyone from Tennessee County. I mean, it's not like I, I didn't protect anyone or anything. He didn't. He had to, uh, no complaints. But anyway, so I got I got it down to like 180, 190,000, and then uh, Bob Mary, who was the longtime editor of Congressional Quarterly, he uh, uh, he was very helpful with all this, and so he he helped me cut the last 30,000 words or so. So I mean, I'm sure there's some good stuff on the cutting room floor, but you know, the publisher didn't want it over 350 pages or whatever it is, so, yeah. Any other questions? I've got a little Here. comment oh. for you. Oh, oh, hold on, uh, okay. Where's it coming? My name is Jim Gillum, I'm from Warsaw. Hi. I'm over with Barbara's cousin, Hugh Tenegan. Hi. Hi. Things weren't always tough for the Cowboys, you know. My brother was a part of the football team in 38 and 39 at Warsaw High School, played with Barber. After the war, Barber played a couple games with our Warsaw Merchants town team football, which I played a couple games on. John Carnival, his brother, played with him. They both were bringing their cards to tackles, tougher than hell. Were they? Both of them. They're way. <laughs> What position did you play? Yeah. Okay. I was the shortest end in the whole league. <laughs> <laughs> but probably the speediest, I'm sure. But more important, something I told my grandkids. Summer, 1938. My brother, Barbara Carnival, possibly John, and eight or ten other athletes and decent young men from Warsaw. Many, many days of a week, of a month, would travel to the farm on Allegheny Road in the town of Castile and hoe beans, <laughs> dry beans, 15 cents an hour. Go out to your grandkids. <laughs> they throw pennies in the parking lot, you know. If they did, I'd be out to pick them off. <laughs> That's all I got to say. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Eric? I'm kind of tired of that. Uh, did he talk about baseball at all? The Senators or Hook Dog or anything? No, I don't think he did. And Jane and Emily would be able to. I don't. I got. I. I got the feeling that he followed football maybe a little, but was not a baseball fan. Yeah, no, he's mostly shouting at the screen. Was yeah. <laughs> yeah. Football was an opportunity to yeah scream and yell and have a lot of fun. All right. Was it the Bills or the Redskins he was following? Redskins. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Dave? You, you had written in Flinders an article about this book that friendship must always trump politics, always. So a comment on that in general, and specifically how that might have shaped Connell's legislating and governance when he to Um <clears throat> Yeah, it's interesting. He. Uh, among the, the you know a handful of other members of Congress that he praises, uh, uh, and they're evenly split really between Republicans and Democrats. I mean, he was uh, he was he admired and was friends with some of the most uh, liberal Democrats in the House and some of the most conservative Republicans, just as he was uh, scornful and contemptuous of some of the most liberal Democrats and conservative Republicans who he, who he thought were were lazy or, or dishonest or whatever. And uh, yeah, I mean, he was uh, he was. In some ways, he was a man of the center, but that's, you know, you think, ah, boring. But he was, his, his views were much more nuanced and, and interesting than that. And, uh, yeah, but, and friendship should always trump politics. We should never. Part of the friendships that he had were because he was sitting next to people in committee, and that's how he got to be friends with George Bush or Jerry Ford. They were sitting next to each other for hours and hours and hours while they had doodles. <laughs> and then they would trade doodles, and then they would all work them. But it really came down to me were sitting next to Friends yeah, yeah. Because you start, uh, I think you start, in fact, I think he, he made a comment once about uh, how important it is to see people multi dimensionally, you know? Instead of just seeing someone saying Republican, Democrat, liberal, what's considered, whatever. I mean, once once you know them in a rounded way and you know other things about them and you've seen them in other contexts, 
it's hard to be mad at them <laughs> or, you know, or, <clears throat> you know, you, that's not to get on soapbox, but today too much, I think we see people unidimensionally, you know, and they don't, they're not, they're not real people to us, you know. You know, we also have to remember Dad was in the minority for 20 years, and to do anything, he had to get along. Right. Everybody, it was very, very frustrating to him. Yeah, it was. You were very clear about that, both of the choices you made. <clears throat> I thought painted a picture that was starker than I realized, certainly, so I learned that. Yeah, but the one, one thing that was interesting is his, because it, He's very, uh, he's very honest, uh, and there's, uh, he's sometimes uh, not quite despairing, but he, he asks himself every couple of years, he says, like, what am I doing here, you know? I'm not getting anything done, what's the point? <laughs> what's life about? You know, and, uh, which I don't know if you, I don't know if you guys saw that at home, but he was, I mean, obviously, usually he's, he's you know, he's, he's, he's cheerful and bright and go get him, but, but there were moments of, I thought this really interesting kind of poetic melancholy to him. Yeah, it's true. Well, played football. He was very headlong. I mean, he loved to rush at things and rush at people and grab their lapels and shake them. And when like, mm -hmm. he couldn't accomplish anything, what do you do next? So he started looking. Yeah. He would always say the government's working exactly how it was designed. Uh, not very well. <laughs> <laughs> Did he in his last um, newsletter say the system's designed not to work, something like that? I think so, yes. I, I sort of remember reading that and, um, and just, you know, it's, you know, being very cumbersome and, and um, very tough to get things passed and you need to compromise. So. Well, he was saying, too, that was a good thing that it was cumbersome so you couldn't just yank oh, things in and oh, yank yeah, them exactly. out and do it quickly and without a lot of thought. Mm -hmm. So you had plenty of time <laughs> to give it consideration. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Oh. Uh, what do you think? Why they didn't operate with like, such integrity? Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I assume, I assume it was his. Oh, what, what, what motivated him to operate with such integrity? Okay. Uh, I assume it was, uh, I assume it was uh, his, uh, his milieu, his up, I mean, his up, his upbringing. I think, you know. His parents, his family, his, his football teammates, <laughs> you know. I think he was, he was raised well and he was raised with a real sense of civic responsibility and uh, what uh, in Gore Vidal used to call proprietary patriotism where there's a sense that country, country belongs to me and it's up to me to, you know, to pitch in. And, uh, and yeah, I think he, I th I think he had that, that kind of sense of obligation. How do we get a copy of that book to every morning in Congress now? Oh, okay. <laughs> I would certainly you know, contribute yes. to that book. Yeah, sure. We're going to buy 435 copies. It's, I'm sure they can give you a discount. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I I agree. I mean, he was he was un, he would have been unusual at any point. I mean, to me, he was kind of what James Madison and those guys had imagined a congressman might be like, and uh, obviously. Precious few who ever lived up to that kind of standard, but uh, he did, and we, you know, we were very lucky to have him. And uh, you know, I mean, it's when he's, those who remember uh, when he was around, I mean, he was just around town. You see him, you see he him at the. He loved being around. He did talking with the boys. That was a really big deal. You know, he loved that stuff. Mm -hmm. So as was mentioned, that in Congress and committee, they would sit Republican, Democrat. Do you have any idea how they gather? Uh, I think it's still the, it's still the same, you know, on different sides. But you know, but you're, you're still gonna you're gonna talk to each other a lot. But I, I mean, I, I mean, I'm so far out of the nodder. But I, my impression is just a lot of polarization, and there's not a lot of uh, working across. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Proximity, the proximity does that. I mean, sometimes you're thrown together in a project with people that uh, might be very different from you. And yet, you find you can work harmoniously, and even if you can't, sometimes you got to cooperate with people. Did he have a hard time uh, going from a pacifist to a warrior? Um, I don't know. I asked him about that once, and he said that uh, because you know, I mean, because pacifism was once a very uh, potent force in this country. There's generally a presumption against wars, and uh, you know, often it was uh, often it was related to. Uh, Religious. I don't. I don't think his father was a religious person. Um, 
But he said uh, he said he came to the conclusion that that was a just war, and that his uh, his friends and people he grew up with were going off to fight it, and he thought he probably should too. I think there was a switch that flipped uh, during Pearl Harbor. Okay. That, okay. I think he just turned at that point. He realized <laughs> he had enough credits, credit choice early. I yeah. Was, was my yeah, yeah. yeah, graduated at age 19. Yeah. Uh, we also never talked about the book to us at all. No? Nothing. We hmm. So I've actually learned more from other people who are on Iwo Jima than I've ever learned from that. Really? Yeah. And he never, never exploited his, uh, you know, Iwo Jima heroism for political gain. I don't, I don't think he even mentioned in his campaigns. You know, I mean, you think some of these guys, you know, they don't go two minutes without uh, asking you to thank them. But, you know, he was, uh, he, th he thought it would be tawdry to campaign as a war hero, you know. Yeah. If duty was a big word in our house, duty, duty to your country, to your party, to your family, mm -hmm. that was how we did Are there other writers or uh, books out there in the wind that maybe tackle this subject from a different perspective? Uh, not uh, necessarily the uh, diary, but uh, uh, yeah, a guy named Jim Fleming was a professor at RIT, published a biography maybe uh, oh, yeah, t 10 years, yeah, yeah, a number of years ago, and that, that's a good book. Um, so that, uh, and I suppose the two, these two could be our kind of companions or complementary. Well, the difference what? is he never let Jim Fleming touch the journals. Mm -hmm. He would not allow, Dad would read aloud from the journals, but mm -hmm. he take notes. So it's still very much Dad's voice, but you didn't touch the journals. They were really under lock and key in his team. Yeah. No, was a, but that book is based more on what he wrote in um, his newsletters. Mm -hmm. That's a newsletter-based account. So you, you hear his voice, but it's different than what you hear in the journal. Yeah, yeah. I remember when Jane said, hey, you want to be the first person ever to read the journals? I said, yes. wow. <laughs> yeah, I do. And then she hands me <laughs> Where's Evelyn Wood when you need her? <laughs> but it was, a, it was a great honor. A great honor to do it. It was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank God somebody typed it. Yes. You would never be able to read it. <laughs> Yeah, the typists were really uh, the heroines of the project. <laughs> this handwriting was really bad. <laughs> Anyone? Well, thank you for coming. Appreciate thank it. You. talking to us about his book, How Myra, that he wrote last year about the Elmira Civil War prison. So if you're interested in that, let me know, and we'll see you then. So otherwise, enjoy the rest of your evening.